Tanya Cash grew up in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. She lived with her father and her stepmother. In 1996, she was 14 years old and studied at Cornell Middle School. A 37-year-old security guard at the school named Thomas Hose would befriend Tanya. Thomas would often take her out of her classes to talk to her. One day, when he caught her skipping classes, he kissed her. As their relationship grew, Thomas would convince Tanya to run away from her home and come live with him. On February 10, 1996, Tanya gathered her belongings and left her home. Her parents thought she had just run away like she had done in the past and didn't report her missing until a week later when she still hadn't returned home. Due to her history of running away, the police would eventually give up the search after just a few days. Ten years later, in 2006, a 24-year-old woman named Nikki Allen walked into a grocery store and told the owner that her name was Tanya Cash and she was being held captive at the hands of Thomas Hose and had been since she was a teenager. The police arrested Thomas. After escaping and coming home, Tanya wrote a book about her experiences called Memoir of a Milk Carton Kid, The Tanya Nicole Cash Story. In the book, she wrote about her trying ordeal. In the beginning, as Thomas lived with his parents, Tanya was kept in his bedroom on the second floor. Thomas went to great lengths to keep Tanya hidden. She wasn't allowed to leave the bedroom and had to go to the toilet in a bucket. Most of the time, she ate only peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, along with a banana and a can of Fago soda pop. About once a week, in the night, Thomas would lead her down to a cellar with cold concrete floors to take a shower. She said in an interview, quote, I was fine at first. I thought I was in love and felt my sacrifices were a labor of my love for Tom. Soon, however, the ordeal began to take its toll. In 2000, Thomas created a new identity for Tanya, Nikki Allen, and introduced her to his parents as his girlfriend that would be moving in with him. After this, Tanya was allowed to leave the house occasionally with a strict curfew. Ten years later, after she was originally coerced to run off with Thomas, Tanya escaped. In 2007, Thomas pled guilty to three counts of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, aggravated indecent assault, statutory sexual assault, interfering with the custody of a child, corruption of a minor, and child endangerment. Thomas pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 5 to 15 years in prison. Stephen Kubaki was a student at Hope College, a small private Christian university near the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan. In February of 1978, Stephen ventured out for several hours of solo cross-country skiing. He would not return home. A day later, when he still hadn't returned, he was reported missing. A massive search was conducted. Searchers found his skis and ski poles on the beach of Lake Michigan and footprints on the ice leading up to the lake, but none walking away. When the rescue crew flew over the area, it was reported that his footprints appeared to stop at the frozen water's edge. There was no sign that the ice had broken anywhere or any clue as to what had happened to Stephen. Later that day, his backpack was found in the same general area as his skis. No other clues would turn up and it appeared that he vanished into thin air. The search was called off soon after. Then, 15 months later, on May 5, 1979, Stephen walked up to his father's house and rang the doorbell. Stephen was surprised to know that he had been missing for 15 months. He told his father he had very little memory of where he had been. Stephen said that he had suddenly woken up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, 700 miles from where he went missing, lying in a meadow wearing clothes that did not belong to him. He also had a small satchel beside him with maps in it, none of which were his. He said that he felt like he had recently been running. His father lived in Pittsfield, 40 miles from where he woke up. Other than that, he had no recollection of where he was or what happened to him in the last 15 months. Following his return, he refused to speak about his encounter with the media, since he had no recollection of it whatsoever. He refused to talk to a therapist, since he said he didn't have to, as he didn't have any psychological problems. In 1983, Stephen got his master's in linguistics, and years later, a PhD in clinical psychology followed. Some would say that getting lost ultimately helped Stephen achieve his goal of helping others find themselves.
In the 1900s, Dr. William Horatio Bates was a well-respected ophthalmologist in New York City. In August of 1902, William wrote a note to his wife stating that he was called out of town to perform some major operation and that he was, quote, glad to get so much money for us all. He further added in his note that he was in a hurry and would write more details later. The note was strange as William was already a wealthy man and his excitement about money seemed odd. Strangely, William wouldn't return home and wouldn't write as he had said so in the note. When he failed to return, his wife started searching for him. William was a prominent mason and his wife would ask for the help of the Masonic Society to try and find him. They distributed his picture around the world. Soon his wife would receive information that William was working as a medical assistant at the Charing Cross Hospital in London after first being admitted as a patient. Strangely, even though William had a bank account with plenty of money with which he could live in the lap of luxury in London, he was reported to be malnourished. Moreover, when his wife arrived in London, William couldn't recognize or remember her. William, however, did accept her offer to stay with her at the Savoy Hotel to rest and to help him recover his memories. At the hotel, he seemed to have recalled being called away from New York to board a ship and perform an operation on someone with a brain abscess. Hearing this, his wife decided to stay in London to help him recover his memories. But two days later, William walked out of the Savoy Hotel and disappeared once more. His wife would never see him again. She spent the next few years tirelessly searching for him in Europe and America until her death in 1907. In 1910, Dr. J. E. Kelly, a good friend of William's, would pass through Grand Forks, North Dakota. There, he would run into William, working in an ophthalmology practice that he had set up himself sometime after his second disappearance. However, he still had no memory of his past life. Kelly convinced him to return to New York and to practice together as partners. William married three times. After being widowed twice, he married Emily C. Lyerman, his longtime personal assistant. William never recovered his memories of his previous life, nor what had happened to him after his first disappearance. Natasha Ryan was a 14-year-old girl living with her parents in Rockhampton, Queensland in 1998. On August 31, 1998, Natasha was dropped off at her school by her mother. When she returned to pick her up, she wasn't there, and she was reported missing to police. An exhaustive and extensive search was carried out for her. In the month prior to her disappearance, Natasha had run away from home once, aided by her 21-year-old boyfriend, Scott Black. However, she was found two days later. Scott was fined $1,000 in November of 1999 when he pled guilty to willful obstruction of police. He was asked if he knew anything about her second disappearance, to which he said he did not know anything about Natasha's whereabouts. Eight months after Natasha went missing, another girl by the name of Kira Steinhardt went missing while walking home from school. After following several leads, police arrested Leonard John Frazier. During Natasha's disappearance, several women had gone missing. The police suddenly began considering the possibility that Leonard was a serial killer and may have murdered Natasha as well. Hopes of finding her diminished and she was soon declared legally dead, with the belief that she had fallen victim to Leonard. Her family held a memorial service in Bundaberg, Queensland on her 17th birthday in 2001. In 1999, Leonard confessed to five murders, including Kira's and Natasha's. The confession was believed to have been made in a deal with police to avoid the general population in jail, given the dim view inmates have on child rapists and killers. Then, on the 10th of April, 2003, as the trial for Leonard was underway in Brisbane Supreme Court, police raided a house in Rockhampton. There they found Natasha Ryan, alive, hiding in a cupboard. It was found that Natasha had staged her disappearance and had been living with her boyfriend Scott since disappearing on the 31st of August in 1998. During her first year in hiding, Natasha had no contact with the outside world. She rarely left her boyfriend's home and stayed inside with the lights off and the curtains drawn. Whenever a visitor came over, she would hide inside a cupboard. For four years, they moved a number of times in the cover of night between properties in Yapoon and Rockhampton. She had been living in Rockhampton for six months prior to being found in 2003. 
Two days later, Natasha attended her own murder trial and told the court that she had never met Leonard and did not know the witness who stated she had seen her with him before she went missing. A jury found Leonard guilty of three murders and he was sentenced to three indefinite prison terms on the 13th of June, 2003. He died in prison on the 1st of January, 2007. In later interviews, Natasha said that by the time she wanted to reunite with her mother, it was too late. The lie had become too big, so she hid. In 2005, Scott pled guilty to telling lies to investigators about not knowing about Natasha's whereabouts. The Rockhampton District Court sentenced Scott to three years in jail for perjury. However, the sentence was suspended after 12 months. A year later, Natasha was found guilty of causing a false police investigation and was fined $1,000. On the 21st of March in 2002, John Darwin, a teacher and former prison officer, went on a canoe trip in the North Sea. He was last seen paddling in his canoe at Sea in Karoo in Hartlepool. When he didn't return home, his wife, Anne Darwin, reported him missing. A massive search involving police and Coast Guard was launched, stretching all the way from Sea in Karoo to Staithes. The following day, his double-ended paddle was found at the sea near Seton Carew. However, no sign of John could be found. The search was later called off and John was presumed dead. Months later, his smashed canoe would turn up at the North Gar near a spot known locally as the Blue Lagoon. In April of 2003, Darwin was declared legally dead. His death certificate stated that after going out to sea, he probably encountered difficulties as a result of which he died. With the help of a death certificate, the grieving widow, Anne, was able to claim her husband's £25,000 life insurance policy, his £25,000 teacher's pension, his £58,000 prison service pension, as well as £4,000 in payouts from the Department of Work and Pensions, and a further £137 from a Norwich Union mortgage insurance policy. The total was £249,000. Darwin was presumed dead until 2007. In 2007, a man walked into a London police station claiming he was John Darwin. He told investigators that he had no memory of the last few years. He was able to give his name, date of birth, and personal details but did not remember where he had been. Anne in the interview said she was overjoyed that her husband was alive. However, unknown to the Darwins, police had been investigating his disappearance, having received a tip that John might be alive and living in Panama. Soon, Darwin's story was exposed as a pack of lies when a photograph emerged on the internet of him posing with his wife in 2006, proving that he was alive all along. It came to light that John had faked his death to escape substantial debts from a failed property and a shared business. Incredibly, Anne helped him pull this off. He, along with his wife, planned his death to claim life insurance money to pay off the debts that he had accrued. According to John, after he faked his disappearance, he moved to the Lake District and would phone Anne regularly to see if the coast was clear for him to return home. A few weeks later, he returned to his home and would stay in an adjacent in-law unit to the family home that the Darwins owned. By the day, he would sit in the adjacent flat, and at night he would creep into the family home through a secret doorway, hidden behind a wardrobe. The couple lied to their family members throughout the ordeal. Even their own sons had no idea he was alive. He allegedly would stay in the in-law unit whenever family members would visit, or if his son stayed overnight. Meanwhile, his wife pretended to friends, neighbors, and her two sons that her husband was dead. As time passed, John became more confident and would venture out donning a hat and regularly limping to conceal his identity. One time, one of his tenants recognized him and asked, aren't you supposed to be dead? John begged him not to tell anyone and got away with it. In 2006, Darwin came up with a new plan to move to Panama and live more openly. He applied for a birth certificate in the name of a dead boy who had been born around the same time as him. Using the birth certificate, he applied for a passport in the name of the dead child, John Jones. His wife told their son she needed to start a new life and would be moving to Panama. The couple flew to Panama on the 14th of July in 2006, where they were photographed by a Panamanian property agent, and the resulting photograph was posted on the internet.
They had planned to buy a house there. However, following a change in Panama's visa laws, John told his wife that their identities needed to be verified by UK authorities and his alias would not pass this time. Darwin then decided to go back home and pretend to have been suffering from amnesia. However, by that time, the police were already investigating his disappearance after a colleague of Anne's had overheard a phone conversation between the couple. Anne was convicted of six counts of fraud and nine counts of money laundering and was jailed for six and a half years. She served three and a half. Darwin pled guilty to fraud, as well as one count of falsely obtaining a passport, and was jailed for six years and three months. He was released in 2011 after serving half his sentence. <laughs>